think about being a movie executive, okay? A highly respected movie executive in Hollywood. Now, I know a lot of you might be saying, okay, Dave, I don't want to think about that because you know how creepy Hollywood is and all that, but just bear with me here. So you're a highly respected movie executive in Hollywood and you're then told, okay, we got a big movie coming out, we got to promote it, things like that, but we have to get the masses ready. What do you do during an advertising campaign when you want to promote the movie? Do you start promoting the movie, you know, uh, just a few weeks before it's going to come out? or a month or two, even three months before it's going to come out. No, if it's a, if you have the money and it's a big budget movie, you're going to promote that movie anywhere from a year to a year and a half before it's going to come out, right? That is exactly what we're seeing here with regards to certain projects that are slowly being drop fed into the public domain, but the narrative is being switched. Now, let's get into it. So first off, this episode is called Project Starfish Prime, Summoning Pocket Dimensions for Metatronic Reversals. Now, I do want to say very quickly, before we jump into all of this, that I will be getting to the shoutouts. If you notice the background behind me is a little bit different than normal. If you're watching on YouTube, that's because I'm doing a little bit of traveling, but I did not make the same mistake I made last time. I brought the studio with me this time, so nothing will really change. I do want to mention uh, one more time as well, too, that we do have a Patreon. It does help support the show. We do tons of Zoom calls, member episodes, early releases, things like that. And I hope all of you enjoyed last week's long form episode um, episode uh, segment, if you will. And so let's uh, let's jump right into this. So a pocket universe, according to Wikipedia, okay, is or a bubble universe, also colloquially called a pocket dimension, is a concept in in inflationary theory proposed by Alan Guth. Now. Astrophysicist John Luke Lenners of the Princeton Center for Theoretical Science has argued that an inflationary universe does produce pockets. In his 2012 journal, Lenners wrote about how pocket universes can emerge as a result of eternal inflation. The mechanisms of inflation within these pocket universes could function in a variety of manners, such as slow royal inflation, undergoing cycles of cosmological evolution, or resembling the Galilean Genesis or other emergent universe scenarios. All right, Lenners goes on to then discuss which one of these types of universes we live in and how that is dependent on the measurement of the regulation of infinites inherent in eternal inflation, end quote. Now, for those of you that say, whoa, Dave, what did you just read from me there? Now, a pocket dimension, most of you have actually heard of this if you've been watching the show. A pocket dimension is something I'm, uh, I spoke of a handful of months ago where the inside of a UFO craft or any particular uh, area or surface is larger on the inside than on the outside, not just in appearance, but in actual physical geometric scale, right? So it's like walking into a minivan or a car and you, you can see with the naked eye, it's a certain size and you get in there and suddenly it's the size of a plane. I'm not even joking. Now, again, you might be saying, Dave, this is nonsense and things like that, but we have to understand the overall concept to, to really harness what's going on here. So Starfish Prime, what was it? Starfish Prime on the front end, according to Wikipedia, was a high altitude nuclear test conducted by the United States, a joint effort of the Atomic Energy Commission, or the AEC, and the Defense Atomic Support Agency. It was launched from Johnston Atoll on July 9, 1962, and was the largest nuclear test conducted in outer space, and one of five conducted by the U.S. in space. Now, a Thor rocket, they called it Thor, was carrying a W-49 thermonuclear warhead designed by Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory, again, what are the odds, and an MK-2 reentry vehicle that was launched from Johnston Atoll in the Pacific Ocean about 900 miles west-southwest of Hawaii, end quote. Long story short, they were just testing nukes, you know, getting really close to space or in space in and of itself, but here's the interesting thing, and this corresponds with what Lou, Lou Elizondo has said recently too. Now, some of you don't believe him, some of you do, and I honestly respect both views. However, he said something that seems to be consistent with my my research as well, which is that when Pro Project Starfish Prime was in fact conducted, what happened there was that they set off a handful of uh, uh, electromagnetic pulses or EMPs, which caused a handful of UFOs to crash in the Pacific, which is interesting, right? Now, here's what's interesting. When Lou Elizondo was asked about this, he blatantly said, he goes, all I'm going to say is that it seemed as though EMPs may in fact cause some objects to fall. Now, from my understanding, he did not uh, specifically cite UFOs, if you will. But I want all of you to take a look at this image right here that I'm going to be putting up. This is a presentation a, from a slide that is being shown around to certain high-level government officials. And I want to show you exactly the way in which they insert this in the same way that I gave the example of that movie campaign in the beginning. Take a look at this. This is just a, sli a slideshow, right? 
a PowerPoint presentation, Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, or ATIP. All right, twofold nature of threat. This is prepared by the Pentagon for high level US government officials. Current threat AAV phenomena of foreign der uh, derivation, including off world, being globally developed slash tested, including in CONUS. Future threat potential uh, terrestrial adversaries achieving significant breakthroughs of game changing disruptive technologies based on evaluations of AAV phenomenon from sensor data or crash slash retrieved materials and quote folks they said it right there and i'm not trying to make this like i'm not trying to overhype this or whatever but take a look at that they admitted it in both of these points that they're presenting to high level government officials i do not believe that this slideshow is classified i mean i don't think it was supposed to get out but i mean again nowadays everything gets out take a look at that they admitted it including off world in brackets and then the second point from sensor data or crash slash retrieved materials. Now, again, of course, it doesn't say extraterrestrially crashed retrieved materials or anything like that, but you see, this is the same way in which they would promote a movie campaign. You put out the teaser trailer. You see what I'm saying? You put out the teaser trailer and then you slowly lead it up to the final thing. Now, I'm not saying that the form of disclosure coming from the government is going to be a good thing. Let me make that very, very clear. But at the same time, we also have to understand that we cannot ignore this because unfortunately, we do not, not have all of the access to this information. Now, let's Let's take a look at this right here mdpi.com the self-simulation hypothesis interpretation of quantum mechanics i'd like to thank my friend riel for this now take a look at this the simulation hypothesis is a materialistic view which argues that our universe is most likely a simulation in a physical universe and quote now this obviously we've talked about this many many times before but the overall concept here folks is that when we look at the fact that pocket dimensions are able to be harnessed for again metatronic reversals we need to understand what that is being used for because a lot of people say okay dave the propulsion system of the craft what is it made up of what does it do and things like that well folks let me tell you this is when i'm I'm going to have to unfortunately continue this in the member side of things because it has to do with with infants and, and FEMA and a handful of different things like that. I don't want to get removed. But what's happening is the EMP test during Starfish Prime, all right, the nuclear test that set off EMPs and all that showed that these craft could in fact be damaged or by the pure nature of the proposal of the document that I just presented to you from that official website there shows that by the presumption of the way in which us living in a very advanced simulation means that no, ma no matter how advanced these extraterrestrials were to get, there would still be imperfections, meaning that the cases in which we have heard in the early 1950s of certain UFO craft being shot down and things like that are actually, in fact, very likely legitimate. Now, here's the next thing I want to take a look at, too, because Starfish Prime is not just about that. It, it is now advanced within the deep underground military bases to include things like, you know, uh, scavenging I I infants and things like this. Why? Because the pure raw blood of some of these infants, as a matter of fact, is able to help fuel some of these pocket dimensions. Why do I say that? Because their blood is in the most infantile stage of the cosmological cycle of the universe. Therefore, it could actually be inserted if harvested in enough in an, a, an accumulated mass way to actually act as a fuel system instead of the fuel system that is being used right now for some of these extraterrestrials. And you might be saying, Dave, what fuel system is that? Well, I'm very glad you asked. First, let's make something very clear. There are different forms of propulsion systems. There's not just one basic system that could produce anti-gravity, right? There are many different things. How we could talk about piezoelectricity, crystalline plasma, all of that, right? The whole concept of, you know, what we know to be, at least on a human level, as Tesla coils and all of that. But let's take a look at Wikipedia right here. Magnetohydrodynamic generator. A magnetohydrodynamic generator or MHD generator is a magnetohydrodynamic converter, I'm just going to say MHD to make this quicker, that utilizes a Brayton cycle to transform thermal energy and kinetic energy directly into electricity. MHD generators are different from traditional electric generators in that they operate without moving parts, no turbine, to limit the upper temperature. They have therefore the highest known theoretical thermodynamic efficiency of any electrical generation method. MHD has been extensively developed as a topping cycle to increase the efficiency of electric generation especially when burning coal or natural gas the hot exhaust gas from an mhd generator can heat the boilers of a steam power plant increasing overall efficiency and quote now folks i am not an engineer i don't know the specifics to this but what i do know is this the vast amount of ufos that were seen above water prior to the starfish prime experiment compared to how little are seen relative to the number that norad had picked up and we could you know john luke um Sorry, uh, Jacques Vallée has mentioned this as well too, but let's be, uh, let's also 
provide some evidence to suggest this as well. So take a look at this right here, independent.co.uk. Scientists find hundreds of examples of mysterious radio blasts coming from deep in the universe. This is from five days ago. You remember the episode I did a couple of months ago? Uh, I forgot off the top of my head, please forgive me, but having to do with different radio blasts that are the echoes of the screams of some of the aliens being tortured, and I expanded on that on Patreon. What ends up happening here, folks, is that the expansion of the screams are now being returned in the way in which the EMP signals are set off geographically based on where the craft are because the same way in which these motherships harness the sun for energy in some cases as we've discussed about on Patreon and I, I believe publicly as well but I had to be careful for some other reasons is the same reason that these craft were using in some cases not all cases some races or sources if you will were using the craft or were using water to power their craft now not in the way of like oh you know the the tank is low or what have you the the water specifically powered the pocket dimensions within the craft now this is the best part the way in which some of these extraterrestrials were able to hide some of these uh, these children from the from uh, President Eisenhower and the human government because they were limited to about a million abductions per year, give or take, right? Uh, according to the 1954 Kriata Treaty, they would use these pocket dimensions to hide the children because by de definition, if you're in a cosmological cycle and you especially take the infants that are at the beginning of this cycle, what can you do from that? You can now take them in the most purest form and as long as you can hide them in a certain way, they're, they're, for the rest of their lives, they could be experimented on, and it's terrible. Now, I'm not trying to fear monger, but at the same time, let's be real here. We have to be vigilant, and how else do I know this? Let's take a look at this right here, folks. This was from uh, June, se uh, this was literally seven days ago. Uh, Unilad.co.uk. Hundreds of ships are vanishing off the coast of Argentina. Ship disappearances are always a cause for concern, and off the coast of Argentina, cases seem to be impacting the fishing industry. All right, which is interesting because Argentina has a secret deal allegedly with a subterranean global network that is directly connected, not deep underground military base, but subterranean global network that is connected to Australia. Now let's take a look at this right here. abc.net.au an affiliate site, if you will. But this is again from uh, March 15th, 2016. U.S. spy boss James Robert Clapper, or Jim Clapper, uh, makes secretive visit to Australia. Now, I'm not going to read the article, but, you know, he basically says the official thing. Under Barack Obama, we're allies, you know, we, we participate in different intelligence operations, blah, blah, blah. The embassy did confirm he was there. Mr. Clapper was there at the exact same time that these craft started disappearing based on the NORAD tracking on the FOIA request documents above water and started appearing more and more within prairies, mountains, things like that. Because again, we're seeing the massive amounts of Metatronic reversals being held in correspondence with the pocket dimensions that could be used, not just for intelligence operations, but to, not just to hide infants, but, and again, I have to be very careful here, but to be able to hide many different things. And it's very possible humans are doing this too, because when you have this type of technology that allows us to be able to elaborate in a way technologically that could do this for us, I'm I mean, it's almost like it's game over at that point, right? It's basically become it's become uh, fighting fire with fire in many different ways, right? So again, I want all of you folks to let me know what you think. I know it's a lot to take in, but what we're seeing here is a lot of this coming together. And I think whether intentionally or not, we are learning about the different propulsion systems in which allow for these craft to be able to manifest. But more importantly, it's the propulsion systems in correspondence with the pocket dimensions. So I'd like all of you again to let me know what you think, and we'll catch all of you very soon. Cheers.